theme of the sermon today is we must be ready. The Lord brings everything together. Amen. Let's go before the Lord. Mighty God, Heavenly Father, truly, we want to hear from you today. Lord God, we want to be prepared for that time when we meet you face to face. We do not want to be ashamed, but rather, Lord, we want to know you and see you as friend, as Savior, not as judge. Lord God, help us to have spiritual eyes that are open, to understand your truth, and that we would love our neighbor, our family, strangers, to the point that we would give them your truth, because we want them to also be in heaven. Help us, Lord, to hear from you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title today is We Must Be Ready, and the notes are on the back of the bulletin. You're welcome to follow along if you'd like to do so. And the question possibly would be, ready for what? Ready for what? Well, being in church, and all of you are mature Christians, you might have an idea of ready for what. But let's look into it. This morning... The message is to be ready for eternity, for the time that each one of us will have our turn, that we will step into eternity. This is part of life. This is the cycle of life after the fall of Adam and Eve. Sister Natalie, is the, is the volume loud enough or no? A little higher? Brother Don? Did I bother you, sir? Thank you. Just a little bit. Okay. If, if anyone ever has a problem with the volume, please do not be shy. We want you all to be able to hear clearly, okay? So we are we're sensitive to your needs, for sure. Okay. The day and the hour unknown. So let's look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. The day and the hour unknown. No one knows about the, that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the day of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. The day and the hour unknown. There will be a day and a time when the Lord will come back, where we will step into eternity, where we will be taken by Him, and we won't be aware of it until that time comes. Everyone will be surprised. We just read in the text here, when we look back at the event of the great flood, at the time of Noah, and that came as a punishment to mankind, people were oblivious that were living in sin, oblivious, and even on the day the flood poured out onto the earth, they were actually having marriages on that day, weddings on that day, celebrations, going to their work on that day. 
The first reason, I've got three reasons that we have to be ready, we must be ready. The first reason is this. The judgment of God is coming because of the sin of mankind. Let's first look at Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 19. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. Are we living at all at a, in a different climate? I believe we're still living in the same kind of climate. That we still see a great wickedness on this earth. And we continue. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. God wants good for mankind. He doesn't want sorrow for mankind. He doesn't want to see mankind hurt. And he doesn't even want to discipline mankind. He doesn't want to bring judgment to mankind. He loves mankind, and he wants mankind to live free from sin, to live in the light. But as God being holy and God being just, he must be the fair just, uh, the fair judge and the, and the godly judge and give justice. And so when there is sin, he has to deal with it. When there is wickedness and lawlessness, he has to deal with it. So God's heart was grieved and filled with pain. And we see that recorded in the word of God because of man's wickedness. Verse 7. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Imagine how many, many, many people there were on, that, on the earth at, the, at that time. And one family, one man who was teaching his family right and uh, drew the line for his family and under his roof, his family would live and honor the Lord. God did not abandon that family, but rather he made a way for even one family to be saved. So there is good news, even when we hear the text of God's judgment, that even if there's one family, the Lord God will make a way for them. Each of you be encouraged. Live for the Lord, and the Lord will not forget you. He will not abandon you, and he will make a way for each one of you. This is his word. He loves you. And we've seen his great sacrifice, how Jesus went to the cross for each one of us because he wanted to make a way for each one of us. We continue. I'm going to now go to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 19. I'm going to summarize what occurred here in the chapter of 19. But basically, there was a very rich and prosperous area. Sodom and Gomorrah, a great metropolitan, a fertile land. And the people took the blessing, and they took the prosperity, and they started living in a great, great, great depravity and wickedness. So God finally, after being patient and hoping for the people to repent, 
he brought a great judgment on this land because of their wickedness. And he burned the land and the people and the homes and the animals with sulfur, with volcanic rock. Everything was burned and scorched. If you go to the area where this is, even till this day, you could go to the area of where Sodom and Gomorrah is. You could travel there. Nothing grows in that area because of how much judgment came on the land at that time. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah brought a judgment to the people. Now we look at the sin of Israel when they were traveling when they were traveling from where? From being slaves to going to a promised land. God freed them from slavery. He told them his plan. He told them where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to a better place. I'm taking you to a future. I'm taking you to a place where you have a hope. And regardless of the promise he gave them, they kept sinning the whole time. And God dealt with them. Now we're looking at Numbers 21 through 6. 21 6. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. I'm going to continue now in 7. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord did deliver them. For the ones who were willing to humble themselves and listen to the instruction God gave them, they were healed from the venom. And there's a great a spiritual lesson as well, and a symbolic lesson that we see fast forwarding with what Jesus did for us and how he freed us and delivered us from the venom of sin. And how he made the way for us and he on the cross was very much some, the symbol of the bronze serpent on the pole that we see here in the Old Testament. So there's, there's phenomenal uh, uh, symbolism there that teaches us a great lesson. But today we're focusing on we must be ready and ready. Why? Because we're all going to step into eternity at one time. And we don't know when that time will come. But we must be ready because there's sin in the world, and God's judgment is going to come for the wickedness of man, for man's insistence to sin, and even for the believers. Because we see here the sin of Israel. It was the people of Israel that God brought out the venomous snakes to. So there are people who are in the world that are sinning, and there are people in the church that are sinning. So people of God need to also be prepared and wake up that the judgment is coming for the people outside the church and for the people inside the church. We have to walk right with God. We have to fly right with God. We have to walk the straight and narrow. We have to live right and true. We have to. Or the judgment that's coming on the people of the world will also come on us because we're not living any different. if we're not living any different. The second reason we must be ready. He is coming for his bride. There's great symbolism in the Bible that Jesus is the groom and the church, we are his bride. He loves his bride. He loves 
his people. He loves his church. And he's coming to rescue them. He's coming to deliver them. He's coming because he loves them. Let's look now at Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. And I'm continuing in 8. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Truly, we need to live in a way have a tongue, have a mind that wants to give honor and glory and praise to God. Those are the people who recognize God as creator and king and savior and friend. When we are willing to praise, worship, give glory to God. Amen. And the third reason that we must be ready. My friends, this is not our permanent home. We might be living like this is our permanent home. We may have an attachment like this is our permanent home. But this is not our permanent home. The Word of God clearly says that we are visitors, that we are strangers, and I want to add the word guests. We are guests in each other's lives. Sometimes we forget that. And that's why maybe sometimes people treat each other in a tough way. How do you treat a guest? When a guest comes over to your home, how do you treat a guest? You treat them almost like royalty. You care for them. You put food out for them. You bring them a beverage. You want them to be comfortable. Right? We should treat each other like guests in each other's lives. We only have each other for a time, for a time, very short time. Very, very short time. All of us, I'm sure, have known someone that has gone on before us. Loved ones, dear to us, that have gone on before us. Let's look at now um, 1 Chronicles 29.15. Forgive me, I was in 2 Chronicles there. I was wondering why I had the wrong verse. There we are. 1 Chronicles 29.15. We are aliens and strangers in your sight as were all our forefathers. Our days on the earth are like a shadow without hope. And the, without the hope part means that eventually we, we will grow frail, our grinders will cease, our windows will grow dim, and then this vessel will we'll return to the earth from where it started, from dust to dust. We are aliens, we are strangers, we are guests in each other's 
lives. You know, when you put it that way, as a guest in each other's lives, and when you put it with that kind of thinking, you, you only have to put up with a guest for so long, right? <laughs> so, so you can kind of take the person that way. Uh, another couple hours, they'll finally be gone. It's okay. <laughs> You guys are laughing way too much. I'm going to make sure when I visit you, it'll be very short and brief, okay? <coughs> In closing, how can we be ready? How can we be ready? We must be ready. So if you have a heart to be ready, how can you be ready? I tell you simply, know the purpose that you were born for. Well, if you ask a hundred people, what purpose was I born for, you might get a hundred different answers. The Word of God, if you turn there for your answer, you will find one consistent answer. Let's look there. Ecclesiastes 12.13 Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Whatever your occupation, wherever you live, this is your duty, to fear God, meaning to revere Him, understand His authority, understand He is the giver of your life. And what? He will bring every deed into judgment. Let's continue. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Let's continue and read it one more time. Fear God and keep His commandments. What are the commandments of God? We look at Exodus chapter 20. Those are Ten Commandments. That's what America was based on, those Ten Commandments. Our founding fathers were Christian, Bible believers and Bible readers. And they made the phenomenal country of America by the teachings of the Bible, with God's blessing on them. That's why America was established, because God's blessing was upon them. And if we choose to keep on rejecting God, His blessing will be removed from us, and we will fall victim from anything, from anywhere, without God's blessing and protection. But fear God and keep His commandments. And what are the commandments summarized by? Do unto others as I'd have them do unto me. Or, yes, do unto others as I'd have them do unto me. The golden rule, right? Or love my neighbor as myself. As I want to be treated, I will treat other people. And we continue. For God will bring every deed into judgment. So we can hide everything from each other. But we cannot hide from our Maker. We could live in secret from each other, but we cannot keep secrets from God. We have to be ready. And if there's something not right in our life, unforgiveness, wrongdoing, eyes, eyes going to the wrong place, our hands going to the wrong place, 
our heart in the wrong place, whatever it might be, you have time left on this earth. Confess. Ask for forgiveness. Ask God to give you strength, and He will. He is the faithful one. And He'll give you life. Now and eternally. If you want to be ready, know your purpose. And your purpose is to live for the honor of God. Live for the glory of God. That's your purpose. The enemy, the devil, people might think that he's an imagination. He's something we created. If you see the darkness that's in the world, you'll know that there really is a dark force. And the enemy is responsible for that. And the enemy can come as an angel of light. The Word of God says that. He can appear in a way that's beautiful and seductive. And tempting. And destructive. We don't realize the path that the devil takes us to. I encourage you, my friends, to keep reading the Word of God daily. Why? If we read the Word of God daily, our mind and our heart and our spirit will be awake and not sleeping. That we will be awake to any tricks of the enemy when the enemy is trying to come into our life and take us astray. When we read the Word of God, God will speak to us through His living Word. But keep it fresh in your life. Every day, the Lord God wants to give you new understanding and to grow you more. You know, in church, we have just a few minutes with you all. If you want to grow to be strong Christians, if you want to grow to be strong disciples of Jesus, you have to take the knowledge that you gain from church and carry it out through your life the rest of the week. That's by reading His Word. He's already given you His complete teaching. It's right here. Every day, take a little bit. Take a little bit and read it and understand it. And believe me, the benefits you'll get from this are by far greater than any health food you can ever take. Amen. One last thing. If we remember when Moses, the, the event when Moses was on the mountain with the Lord. He was, in, he was in fellowship with God. And this is before the people went crazy and built their uh, golden calf. No, uh, Moses was doing the right thing. Moses was on the mountain in fellowship with God. He was there for 40 days. And the Bible doesn't record he had any food with him or anything like that. But when he came down off that mountain, his face glowed, was shining to the point the Israelites pleaded with Moses, pleaded with Moses, Moses, you've got to cover your face. It was hurting maybe their conscience, but, but it was also hurting their eyes, the glow that was coming off Moses. The Lord God sustains us. He will sustain your flesh. He will, he will sustain your mind. He will sustain your emotions. He made us as his joy. But we are the ones that have gone astray and got involved in all these other things. We've made our work more important than Him. We've made our entertainment more important than Him. We've made our own purposes more important than Him. But believe me, if you keep God first and foremost in your life, you will find great purpose for your life. And every day will be purposeful and joyful. I tell you, my friends, put it to the test. And you'll see.
Let's go before the Lord. Mighty God, Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we know that you are the one that gave us the gift of life. We know, Lord, that it is by your mercy that we live. Lord, we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that we will be a people that will be ready when we will meet you face to face. Lord, we pray that we will keep running the good race, the godly race, the righteous race in this life. That we will keep doing the good that you want us to, that you've put on our heart to do. Lord, we know sometimes it's easier to give up. Lord, we know it is sometimes you know, seductive or, or tempting to go do what the rest, rest of the world is doing. But Lord, we have to remember, and help us to remember that this life is fleeting, and there will be a day of account that we will have to give an accounting for how we have spent our time and our years. Lord, help us to see you and meet you and be proud of the good that we've done not ashamed of how we've spent our time on this earth. Give us wisdom, Lord, and direct our paths. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.